Welcome to part two of my video series on juice fasting. As I did in the last part, I will start with a short introduction before we go on to the main subjects at hand. In part one of this video series, we covered two main chapters on how to get started on a juice fast. Chapter one went over what a juice fast is and what its purpose may be. What does going the distance mean and what bodily systems must you pay attention to? How does one choose and acquire the right juicer? And how do you set up a realistic budget? Chapter 2 went over how much to drink, what to drink, and how to set up a proper juicing schedule. If you have not seen this video yet, I highly recommend you to watch that one first, as the subjects that we will go over in part 2 build heavily on those of the first video. You can find the link to video 1 down below in a pinned comment. In part 1 of this video series, I explain that I have done over 200 days of juice fasting myself, if you exclude the break in the fast period, which would actually add days of juicing on top of these 200 days. These 200 days include a 119 day juice fast, a 57 day juice fast, a 21 day juice fast, and a couple of shorter 3 to 4 day juice fasts. I would like to emphasize again that everything discussed in this video series is based on my own experiences, those of others I have talked to or coached, and the research I have done myself. I advise you to further research everything that will be discussed in this video series and build on your own experiences. As a wise man once said, trust nothing but your own experiences. This video will contain one chapter. At first, as I also mentioned in the closing thoughts of the last video, I wanted to create two separate chapters for this video. However, whilst writing the chapters, I realized it was better to combine the two into one. Chapter 3 will discuss moving the bowels, moving the body, and moving the mind. Simultaneously, it will also touch upon possible social isolation, mental detox, and how to deal with them. We will go over these subjects in detail. You can find the timestamps of the different subjects down below in the description box. During this video, you might hear background noises, such as wind or a cracking tree, or perhaps the distant noise of a car passing by in the background. I am once again recording this audio in my car, in the woods. As I stated before, this video has chapters just like a book will. The audio in this video has been spoken by me as if reading a book. Therefore, this video aims to be more of an audio book than anything else. I'd like to conclude this introduction by saying that if you have any questions or anything to add, that you can do so in the comments. There will also be a pinned comment with links to my website, specific contact I referred to in this video, and other useful links and details. Without further ado, let's get started. Chapter 3. Moving the Bowels, the Body, and the Mind Moving the Bowels In the last part of this video series, we touched upon the importance of drinking a minimum of 4 liters or quarts or 1 gallon of juice daily and it being advisable to cover your basal metabolic rate with these primary 4 liters of juice. We also touched upon the other reasons for drinking a minimum of 4 liters a day and when possible, drinking even more than that. As previously mentioned, one of the purposes of a juice fast is to rehydrate the uneliminated waste matter in the digestive tract so that it can be pooped out of the body. In effect, the more juice you drink on a daily basis, the faster this uneliminated waste matter will get rehydrated and reach critical mass. When it reaches critical mass, in essence it has absorbed so much juice that it reaches a specific weight, it will start to break off or release and be flushed out towards the nearest exit. And I don't think I will need to explain which one. It will then be able to be pooped out of you. It is therefore of high importance that you drink as much juice as you possibly can with your available budget and physical capabilities. The more you drink, the faster your progress in getting your digestive tract cleaned out will be. Of course, you will still have to take practicality into consideration. If you can comfortably drink 5 to 6 liters a day and make good progress on that, then by all means do so. If you experience exceptional progress on 4 liters, it can still be worth a shot to try 5 to 6 liters and see how phenomenal your progress can be. Having revisited those explanations once more, we can now dive into the possible options at your disposal that can work in conjunction with the juice to get the bowels to move. Firstly, it is very important to understand that your bowels need to be moving on a regular basis, preferably at least once a day. Of course, it goes without saying that it is important to move your bowels on a regular basis if you want to make good progress towards cleaning out your digestive tract and going the distance. But there is, of course, another reason behind the importance of moving the bowels on a regular basis. Namely, that the uneliminated waste matter might have been illegally squatting in your body anywhere between a few days to perhaps years or even decades. As with any unwanted visitor on someone's property, it has long passed the toleration point. Proper manners of unwanted visitation aside, when something has been sitting in your body for weeks, months or even years or decades, it can cause to start problems. The uneliminated waste matter that has been sitting there for years has most likely already left its mark. 
When it was sitting there, slowly fermenting and rotting away, it most likely has released a multitude of compounds including toxins or chemicals that were either present in the quote-unquote food you consumed or were created during the fermentation and rotting process. Who knows what the results were, but they most certainly weren't a festivity for the body and its systems. You can of course now start to imagine why it is more important to start moving the bowels on a regular basis when doing a properly conducted juice fast, as the relatively fresh stuff has yet to fully unload and perhaps create its payload of dangerous goodies. Whereas it is of course of great importance to get rid of the old, sticky and slimy stuff, it is of great and utter importance to get rid of the relatively fresh stuff as soon as possible, as this can still deliver its punch of nastiness on a daily basis. Another aspect of moving the bowels on a regular basis is that the uneliminated waste matter present in the digestive tract, albeit relatively fresh or very old and placking up the bowel walls, is most likely blocking nutrient absorption and waste elimination. There are five stages to the consumption of food, namely ingestion, digestion, absorption, utilization, and of course elimination. Having an obstructed or placked up digestive tract wall will severely limit the amount of absorption and utilization taking place. Not to mention that full elimination does not actually take place in the way it is supposed to when the bowel walls are obstructed. Some of you might now start to grasp the unsettling realization that our cells also ingest, utilize, and of course eliminate the materials they use to perform their various tasks. They are, after all, living entities linked to our well-being. However, one of their ways of eliminating their waste is through our digestive tract. If the wall surfaces of this tract are placked up, in essence in some way obstructed or fully obstructed, the cells will not be able to dump their waste matter effectively. It will remain, to some degree or even fully, in the interstitial lymphatic fluids that flow in between the cells. This can start to pile up, back up, and cause damage or further issues for the cells and the tissues of the body. When the bowels are emptied of this uneliminated waste matter and the bowel walls are cleaned and restored to proper function, the colon can then again be fully used as a channel of elimination and even an alternative channel of elimination if need be. Having made my point clear on why it is important to move the bowels on a regular basis, I would also like to touch upon the importance of keeping notes on what is coming out of you. When I started my first long juice fast back in June of 2019, I started recording what came out of me from day 3 onwards. The reason for this was as follows. There was no one out there on YouTube or the internet that I could find that actually showed me what came out of them, in what volume and frequency, and how it all related to what they drank. I was therefore sailing in uncharted territory as far as I was concerned, and I decided that I would document it all myself, as to make sure that I had full insight as to what was happening to me and how things were moving, literally. You now might wonder, why did you start recording from day 3 onwards and not from day 1 onwards? Good question. The reason I kept track from day 3 onwards was because that was the first day I had a solid bowel movement on my long juice fast. And I didn't stop having solid bowel movements until day 108. How do I know this? Because I kept notes on every single movement I had during my first long juice fast. My notes were quite detailed and I kept track of how many movements I had during a day and what type of movements they were. I would even write down the movement's textures, its foul smell, and how it made me feel when it was approaching when it finally came out. I added to this by taking a photograph of everything solid or remarkable that came out of me. This documentation gave me a very powerful tool by which I could track my progress and, more importantly, keep an eye out for any type of pattern that might reoccur, meaning that I could recognize and perhaps predict what would happen next, which was a very nice insight to have. This happened to be the exact case on many occasions. At around the 4-5 to five week mark, I started to notice that the same pattern kept repeating itself. I would have a big solid movement, which would make me feel uncomfortable before it came out. Whenever I got rid of this big solid stuff, usually old and disgusting, I would feel so much better. This was then followed by a day or perhaps a few days of some smelly liquid movements, with perhaps some little strands, slight lumps, or some little muddy textures in there. This would then itself, depending on how much I drank, move on to muddy and very sticky textured movements that could last anywhere from a day to a few days. These movements would give way to lumps with grooves in them, also known as diverticuli, or formed solid movements, which themselves would be followed by the big boy, the unsettling and disgusting old waste matter. Sometimes there were slight variations in this pattern, and one movement or the other would show itself less or more, depending on what was coming out of me. However, this pattern repeated itself right up to day 108 for me, and I've noticed the same type of pattern in other people's notes or explanations of their movements since. I put these notes next to my notes on what I drank on a daily basis and realized that specific quantities and types of juices had specific effects on my body. 
I noted specifically that the lemon ginger blast and watermelon juices produced the best results for me. I was then able to manipulate these variables to produce the best results for me. Had I not kept notes on my juice fast, I would have never known these intricate details and could not have acted upon them. Not to mention the mental rest these insights gave me, as I felt I was in control to some degree during my juice fast. Another pattern I noticed with the help of my notes was that I would get, with the lack of a better term, cravings just before the big boy, the old and disgusting stuff came out. I would get the wildest memories and thoughts for things I had not eaten in years, such as pizza or a rice, peas and tuna fish dish. At first I was taken aback and was at a loss why these memories and feelings started to appear. I had no desire to eat those dishes for a few years at that point. But then, looking over my notes, I realized that these cravings showed up exclusively right before something old and nasty was about to come out of me. I quickly realized that these cravings, although annoying and sometimes intense to the point of emotional response, were a sign of something old and nasty making its way out. I was then able to use these cravings as a good sign of what was about to come. I even developed my own theory that whatever I was remembering food-wise was linked to what came out of me. I had most likely created the stuff with the food in question that I was remembering. However, I have no way of actually confirming this other than explaining my own experiences. As you can clearly see, keeping notes is very important, but I would say taking pictures is just as important or perhaps even more. Having available, visual representation of things that came out of you is very useful in a couple of ways. Firstly, you will have a visual representation to fall back upon to see if you passed specific movements before. This way you can keep an eye, literally, on whether you are digging deeper into the depths of the cesspool inside of you. Secondly, you can relate this to your notes of what you were drinking and how you were feeling, so as to see what juices might produce more effective results. Thirdly, and this one is actually pretty hilarious, you can use these pictures to get people off your back that might bother you during your juice fast. I can't recall how many times people were lecturing me on my imminent starvation whilst being six to eight weeks into my long juice fest. I could shower these people with facts, entire logs on how much I drank and having it relayed into calories and nutrients, but to no avail. However, when I asked them if they wanted to see the stuff that was coming out of me, after all I had by this time a detailed catalog of all my movements, they would flat out refuse. Not to mention, they would often walk or move away with such sudden alarm that you would think that they thought the building or the premise was on fire. Afterwards, they would never bother me again. A handy little card up your sleeve when dealing with the nuisance that is ignorance incarnated in a body. Now that we have gone over the general aspects of moving the bowels and keeping notes for insights, we will now look at the various means you can use to assist in breaking up this uneliminated waste matter and move it out of the body. One useful option at your disposal is massaging the colon. Massaging the colon area is a very good way of assisting the juices in rehydrating and breaking up the possible present uneliminated waste matter. By massaging the colon wall, which can be exposed by twisting the body in specific ways, you can help break up anything that might be sticking to the surface of the colon wall. In my own experience, and those of others I have talked to or coached, this always produced good results and helped them to quicken the process of getting rid of the uneliminated waste matter. I myself tested the effectiveness of massaging the colon during my long juice fast. I would simply massage my colon for a few days, and then proceed to not massage it for a few days to a week. I could see the different results in my notes and they were usually quite severe. When massaging my colon, I would see an increase in movements and I would see more solid movements at that. If I stopped massaging the colon area, I would see a significant slowdown of movements. When you start massaging the colon, you might want to look up an image on how the colon is shaped and what the different parts of the colon are that you will be massaging. Firstly, before we go into details of the procedure of massaging the colon, I would like to speak a few words of caution. You will have to realize that what you are about to massage can be full of uneliminated waste matter that has been sitting there for weeks, months, years or decades. This could have caused damage, pain, stagnation and above all tenderness. The spots in question you will discover straight away, as they are very tender and sensitive. You will want to focus on these areas, but with caution. What has been created in years or decades will not be undone in a mere 10 minutes of massaging and 3 liters of juice. I remember one spot about an inch or two and a half centimeters above my belly button. It started to get sensitive around day 15 of my first long juice fest and I experienced a strange sensation of inner pressure in that area. Its sensitivity increased and I could even feel it when making specific twists and turns with my torso. However, I was determined to get whatever it was that was causing it out of my body. So I massaged this spot for a few days with varied intensity based on how much I could take and eventually the sensitivity lessened and lessened and it went away completely. 
An interesting side note here is that when I did my cooked food experiments after my first long juice fast, I felt that exact same spot once again. But now the pressure I felt was in the opposite direction. I feel that spot got filled up again when I did my experimentation. However, when I went on my second long juice fast of 57 days, I had no sensitivity at all and I could massage and press on that spot all day without having anything resemble an alarming feeling. Very interesting indeed. When massaging the colon, consistency is key. It will take some time to break up old stuff, so give it the time it needs. When massaging these tender areas, you will want to dig in and use force, as to break loose old and dried up stuff. But you must also keep in mind that you might, depending on what damage you have down there, are digging into weakened or damaged tissue. It is wise to let something that hurts a lot be for what it is for now. Tenderness is one thing, but actual pain is another. Let the juices do their magic in these pots and just revisit them from time to time and establish if more force can be used later. Back to the picture of the colon and how it is shaped. When doing a colon massage, you want to lay down on your back, preferably on a comfortable surface that will support your body fully. You will then bend your knees, pull them up, and slowly turn and lower your hips to the right side of your body, just like you would with a particular back stretch. This position will expose the left side of the colon wall and allow it to be massaged effectively. We will start with the left side of the colon as we want to get rid of anything that might be stuck there before we turn to the right side which is connected to all of the small intestines and can thus result in a lot more waste matter coming through. You will start by massaging the descending colon's wall and, based on how tender it is, you can dig in there with force. You will then move on to the sigmoid colon and finally all the way down to your crutch. You will want to make clockwise movements with your fingers whilst simultaneously making downward movements. A favorite tactic of mine was to also push my body slightly upwards, meaning that I would have the force of my fingers pushing down and the force of my body pushing up combined. This allowed me to dig in deeply. I would personally spend a good 5-10 to 10 minutes on this side, moving over all this colon area a couple of times. Afterwards, I would move on to the right side of my body. Of course, when moving on to the right side of the body, you simply twist your hips the other way around. After having exposed the right side of the colon, things get a little more interesting. The small intestines meet up with the colon in this area, namely down where the cecum and the ileum, which is the last part of the small intestines, meet. At this point, there is a valve called the ileocecum valve. You will want to use the same force of movement when massaging the cecum and the ascending colon as you did on the descending and sigmoid colon. However, you will now move upwards, of course. You will also spend additional attention on the ileocecum valve, as waste matter might build up there and block it. Here we want to massage clockwise and especially make short and purposeful upward movements at the same time so that we can open up this valve. This may sound complicated at first, but there isn't much you can do wrong here. Simply massage clockwise and move upwards at the same time. Once you have worked on the valve, you will move up to the season and the ascending colon towards the transverse colon. Now this part is somewhat harder to massage as the abdominal wall protects this part and it can make it harder to massage the colon wall here. I tried on many occasions and never really got it to work myself, apart from the spot above my belly button. If you find a way, please let us know, but if you can't, don't worry. You can still get phenomenal results without massaging this part. You can now repeat the entire cycle a couple of times, or as often as you like. I personally found that I enjoyed massaging a couple of times a day in short bouts of about 10 to 20 minutes a time, while watching or listening to something, perhaps even while sunbathing. I especially like to do this an hour or two or so after drinking juices. Just remember to start on the left side of your body and then do the right side. Another thing you can do in assisting the bowels in moving frequently is exercising. Although we will go over moving the body in more detail later, I would like to make a few points in regards to moving the body when it comes to moving the bowels. During my first long juice fast, I was doing a multitude of exercising daily. This ranged from riding my bicycle, to walking, to running, to swimming, to lifting weights, doing calisthenics, and using resistant band exercises. All of these activities gave me immense benefits, but in regards to moving the bowels, there was one type of exercise that produced the best results. Whenever I did weightlifting or calisthenics, and particularly doing movements that would twist, turn, bend, or straighten my torso under load, I would always get more frequent and bigger movements. Whenever I would do these type of exercises, I could always feel things moving inside my intestines. The juice would be moved around frequently during the twisting of my torso in different dimensions. This would also put, at least that is what I felt, pressure on the waste matter inside my digestive tract and allow it to be better rehydrated. Whether this is actually the case, I cannot say. 
What I do know, however, is that every single time I did these types of exercises, I would have significant movements the next day and sometimes even a few hours after the exercising. Many people know of the power of herbs and I heard many tales about them and their potency. As you can imagine, herbs are another way to help the bowels in moving frequently. Unfortunately for our subject at hand, I know very little of herbs and I can't say anything conclusive as to what herbs would benefit the bowels and moving them. Trying to do so would result in nothing worthwhile. Therefore, I like to ask the listeners or viewers who are versed in herbal lore or perhaps have experience with herbs to leave a comment down below with further information on herbal formulas or specific herbs that can help the bowels move. What I do know, however, is that herbs can mimic the peristaltic movement of the digestive tract. Peristaltic movement is actually the contracting and consecutive relaxing of the muscles in a digestive tract, allowing them to create movement, which aids in digestion and moving food along. When you cease to eat and drink nothing but freshly squeezed juices, you of course cease to have any significant peristaltic movement. However, herbs can supposedly aid in the creation of this. A word of caution though, whenever relying on specific herbs or a formula of herbs or any type of project that helps in moving the bowels, you must always be aware of the possibility that your bowels might cease to move on their own. In other words, you can after some time become dependent on whatever it is you take to move the bowels. In order to prevent this, be thoughtful when it comes to using specific compounds such as herbs. Enemas are another great way of aiding the bowels to move. Enemas can be done in different ways, including coffee enemas and water enemas. The most common used enema is a water enema. Hereby one uses an enema kit, which will contain a bag for the water, which is connected to a tube that runs along until it comes to a plug at the end. The plug is operational in the sense that it has a lever on it to open or stop the movement of water. There are many different enema kits, with various different qualities and they all come with different instructions too. It is however advisable to not use more than 2 liters of water at first or perhaps at all as it can be quite uncomfortable to hold more than that inside your body. To start you will lay down on your sides with your legs curled up in a fetus position. I mentioned the plural, sides, as due to the water not fully reaching all corners of your colon you will want to switch the sides you are laying on to make sure the water gets as far as it can. The bag with water is attached to a higher surface as to allow gravity to pull the water down through the tube. The plug is inserted in the anus and then allows the water to enter in the colon. The water will then flush out specific parts of the colon and will allow waste matter to be flushed out. You will want to keep the water in your body anywhere between a couple of minutes to perhaps 15 to 20 minutes. As you can imagine, this is not an action that everybody holds dear, let alone looks forward to. However, it is an action that helps greatly when someone has, for example, a rectal plug. A rectal plug is a situation where unlimited waste matter has broken off as a big chunk and eventually, when reaching the exit, it gets stuck. This can happen for various ways, but as you can guess, the most likely scenario is that it is too big and simply can't pass through the exit. A water enema is ideal for breaking this stuff up and making it passable. Another benefit of water enemas is that they help with cleansing reactions. Whenever cleansing reactions are at hand and severe at that, it means our organs of elimination are not up to the task or overwhelmed whilst doing their tasks. A water enema can give relief here. Another popular way of doing a water enema is to add lemon juice to the water. This is an astringent formula that can possibly break up any unilluminated waste matter quite effectively. Another interesting thing when it comes to enemas is that they can help people who are severely dehydrated. Whenever you have problems with keeping fluids down, such as keeping juice or water in your system and are constantly vomiting or having heaps and bounds of diarrhea, you can use an enema to rehydrate the system. This is especially helpful when you don't have access to a hospital and an IV with fluids. It is advisable to watch a tutorial on how to do an enema properly. For those hoping that I would use my own footage as an example here, I must unfortunately disappoint you. A word of caution though, as with the herbs, there is a time and a place to use an enema. You must however be sure that you don't become reliant upon an enema to get your bowels to move. Doing enemas too often can cause your bowels to not move on their own anymore. Something to keep in mind when you actually like that plug sensation near your bottom exit. As we touched upon more astringent options for enemas, I would also like to touch upon drinking more astringent juices to help break up uneliminated waste matter and thus helping the bowels moving it out of the body. Astringent juices are a lot more aggressive and can help break up uneliminated waste matter quite effectively. Juices to think about are all the citrus fruits such as lemons, limes, oranges, grapefruits, pineapples, etc. You can also think of green apples, or for example red or dark grapes to a certain extent. Remember however that these are powerful cleansers and you must take into account the cleansing hit they will leave on your body. Whatever they pull out, your body must deal with. If your organs of elimination are not up to the task or compromised in any way, 
you might want to take it easy at first with these types of juices. Another side note to make here is that there exists a very potent juice recipe that embraces astringent properties to create results. This juice is called the Lemon Ginger Blast. There are many variants of this drink, but the one I make has green apple, spinach, celery, cucumber, ginger, and lemon or lime in it. This recipe is extremely potent at getting stubborn uneliminated waste matter out of your system and uneliminated waste matter in general. A word of caution here though. When I first tried Lemon Ginger Blast, I misread the initial instructions on taking it slow and starting out with two glasses. I actually started out with two liters or two 32 ounce mason jars worth of Lemon Ginger Blast. Unbeknownst to me, this ended up being a wild ride of a sleepless night and my ticket to immense kidney filtration. This juice produced intense sensations in my bowels and an immense sensation of activation in my kidneys. I could feel something akin to a piston engine turning and turning in that area of my kidneys. It got very warm down there and I could feel pressure building up and releasing throughout the night. The very next morning I was greeted by a huge amount of kidney filtration and a nasty bowel movement on top. Quite potent, you are warned. To summarize, when doing a juice fast, it is imperative to move the bowels frequently. By doing so, you will, at a good pace, get rid of the possible build-up toxins and chemicals present in your bowels, as well as the old unlimited waste matter at that. It is advisable to drink more than 4 liters, or quarts, or 1 gallon a day, as to speed up the process of eliminating the unlimited waste matter from the digestive tract. This will ensure you will move the bowels more frequently and progress quicker to being cleaned out. It is advisable to keep notes on what you are drinking, what comes out of you on a daily basis, and when possible, take pictures of your movements. This way you will gain valuable insights on what is happening and how to possibly proceed next. You will also want to massage your colon daily in order to resist the juices in breaking up the old and dried up fecal matter in your digestive tract. You might consider doing specific exercises that will bend and twist the torso under load, albeit with added weights, or simply by doing body weight oriented exercises or using resistance bands. You might want to consider herbs and enemas to assist the bowels in moving more frequently and possibly using enemas when dealing with cleansing reactions. Lastly, you might want to look into specific astringent juices in order to add some more aggressive cleansing to your regimen. Moving the body. As I previously mentioned, we will delve deeper into the exercising and the moving the body aspect of a juice fast. As I touched upon before, moving the body with specific exercises that will bend and twist the torso under load albeit with added weights or simply by doing body weight oriented exercises, can assist greatly in moving the bowels. However, there are more benefits to moving the body throughout the juice fast and of course many different ways of doing so. We will go over them one by one. Before we delve into the different benefits and ways of moving the body, I like to spend a little attention to the concept of exercise. Exercising nowadays is usually connected to doing something strenuous, something that truly taxes the body. Somehow when we talk of exercise, we think of lifting weights, running a 4 minute mile, swimming across the North Sea Channel, doing advanced calisthenics moves, or climbing rocky caverns without a safety rope and cheating death by doing so. When I talk of exercise in this moving the body part of the video, I mean any type of activity that will move the body and thus the blood and the limbs, whether this is strenuous or at leisure or somewhere in between is irrelevant. What matters most is that you move your body on a daily basis and enjoy whatever it is you do. As I just mentioned, Moving the body moves the blood and the lymph. Moving the blood and the lymph is of utmost importance when doing a juice fast. When moving the blood, we make sure that all the nutrients and oxygen gets delivered to the tissues that need them. We make sure that a fresh supply of newly needed minerals, vitamins and for example enzymes and the likes are present at our organs of elimination and tissues in need of repair or healing. Of course, our blood flows all the time. But by exercising, we force our blood to be moved in a greater quantity to, depending on what type of exercise you do, all parts of our body. Walking, cycling, running, swimming, climbing, gardening, cleaning at the house, lifting weights, doing calisthenics, doing yoga, doing yoga with a goat. Yes, seriously, that is a thing nowadays. Just look it up. And anything that moves your body will move the blood extensively. Moving the body will also move the lymph, especially when sweating is involved. When we sweat, our body moves a lot of lymphatic waste out through our skin. Again, it is of importance here that you understand that it doesn't mean you will have to run a couple of miles or kilometers in order to have a good lymphatic movement and a good sweat. I recently had to help my parents dig a trench and heaps of holes in their new garden. With helping them dig a trench, I of course mean to say that they let me dig the trench whilst cowering behind the argument of my youth. Let me tell you, 
I hadn't had a sweat to such extremes in months and months of doing calisthenics, going for a run, and riding my bike in very hot weather. It rivaled being in a sauna. As long as you move your body, you will move your blood and your lymph. If you do anything that creates a sweat, albeit a light, or a medium, or a soul evaporating sweat, then you are kicking it up a notch elimination-wise. Again, in regards to exercising, simply move your body every single day. Do something you enjoy. When you do so, it will also bring you mental relaxation. One of my favorite types of exercises was simply to bike into the woods and go for a walk and then resume my bike ride. The amount of relaxation that brought me has not been equaled by anything else than perhaps going to the coast and watching the waves beat on the land and seeing the seagulls play dive bomber in the seawater. Now I know, there are some amongst our listeners and viewers who are parents and have a child or multiple children to look after each day. It of course goes without saying that it is quite strenuous to have to run after them all, keep an eye out, make sure they are fed and well provided for. Not to mention having to take care of yourself as well and making sure that you drink all of your juices and get everything you need. However, although this running after children is exercise enough in certain aspects and on any warm day will make you sweat quite a waterfall, it is still falling short in one regard. When doing a juice fast, we want to protect our lean body mass in every conceivable way possible. As I explained in the previous video, we preferably want to cover our basal metabolic rate with our primary 4 liters or quarts or 1 gallon of juice. Afterwards, based on our activity, we add juice in order to meet our caloric needs. When we meet our caloric needs, we most of the time, when drinking vegetable juices as well, cover our nutritious needs too. When we cover our nutritious needs, we will ensure that our body will not purge our lean body mass. When we cover all our needs, calorically and nutritionally, we will ensure that our body will not purge our lean body mass. However, there is another aspect we must keep an eye on. When some parts of our body aren't used very often, or not at all, our body will see these parts as useless energy expenditures that aren't needed. So the body will employ the millennia old phrase of, if you don't use it, you will lose it. This would be a most unfortunate event, as we don't want to lose our lean body mass and become weaker and more frail. No, we want to keep our lean body mass, our muscle mass so to speak, and maintain it, perhaps even add to it. We must therefore use our lean body mass in specific exercises as well. I have seen many juice fasters get quite thin on their juice fast. Whenever I take a look at what they did, or when I ask them what they did, it is usually quite apparent why they gotten so thin. Firstly, some people simply don't drink enough and waste away their lean body mass and eventually get rid of most of their body fat too. This will result in skeleton syndrome pretty fast once both bodily domains of muscle and fat are depleted. Secondly, and sometimes they do this in tandem with the first point, they simply don't do any type of exercise to maintain or improve their lean body mass. Again, if you don't use it, you will lose it. This actually happened at the end of my 119 day long juice fast. I was in this perfectly happy state of drinking juices, enjoying bike rides, going for walks, and sometimes doing this two or three times a day. I covered my caloric needs quite well, and I had no problem covering my extra movement too. However, I stopped doing any type of resistant exercises. I did so because I felt I didn't want to put that strain on my body while I was in the process of cleaning and healing it. So I stopped doing weightlifting and I didn't do any calisthenics and I also stopped doing resistant band exercises. This meant that after some time my body concluded, well gentlemen, we don't need this extra muscle right now, time to get rid of it. Had I not stopped doing this, I am quite confident that I would not have gotten to the thinner stage at the end of my 119 day juice fast. I have since thought of plenty of easy ways to incorporate moderate resistance exercise to protect the lean body mass. Having made my point clear on why it is important to protect your lean body mass as well, I would like to make it clear that you will need to do some form of resistance exercise two to three times a week. This way you will regularly stimulate your muscles while still allowing for proper recovery and signal your body that these muscles you have are needed and perhaps even in need of a little improvement. There are a couple of things to consider when you are going to choose resistance exercises you like to do. You can get into the habit of lifting weights, doing calisthenic movements, doing yoga, with or without goats, or some type of resistant band exercises. I know some who even do rock climbing. I personally prefer to do light calisthenics with resistance band exercises during juice fasting. I remember doing weightlifting during my first juice fast and actually gaining quite a bit of muscle whilst doing so. But I felt it taxed my body to a certain degree that didn't aid my healing and cleansing. However, I know of people such as Robin from Consistent Life Balance who simply continue to pound the poundages whilst juice fasting without it taxing his healing and cleansing. I will leave a link to Robin's channel in a pinned comment down below. As you can clearly see, it simply differs from person to person based on how they feel. 
What will not differ from person to person, however, is the need to do resistant exercises in order to preserve lean body mass. Whether you are a man or a woman, you will need to maintain your lean body mass. Yes, you heard that right. Women must do so too. In order for you as a woman to become a muscle mass monster, you will need a lot more than a simple resistance band or calisthenics workout two to three times a week. So don't worry about that. However, you will still need to maintain some form of resistance exercise two to three times a week in order to maintain your lean body mass and not become thin. Whatever form of resistance exercise you do, make sure to do it in such a way that your entire body and its muscle groups are worked by it. It will surprise you how many home workouts you can find on YouTube or the internet that require nothing more than either a simple light resistance band and or your own body. Simply have a look and choose what seems most interesting to you. A word of caution though. Whenever you come across the six pack shortcut video series of yet another clown that wants you to pay him $500 to get the most secret and effective abdominal workout ever known to man, please do not fall for it. Also, do not forget to keep moving your body daily with whatever exercise you choose. Also, in case you were wondering, there are even yoga classes with chickens, dogs, cats, birds, and even supposedly ferrets. It seems the sky is the limit when it comes to exercising. We are truly living in blessed times. Moving the mind. Since we have now looked at the importance of moving the bowels and the body, we will now direct our attention to moving the mind. You might now start to wonder, what on earth does moving the mind even mean? Well, I don't mind explaining that to you, but before I do, let us first take a look at what the mind has to do with the juice fast in general. As many of you know, our minds can be a never-ending hurricane of thoughts, emotions, and beliefs. The mind will most likely never cease to amaze you with its ways of never-ending rationalization. For good or worse, it will find a way through every crack or opening to make its presence felt by utilizing its most powerful ability of all, the emotions. As you can imagine, this will also be the case with a juice fast. However, with a juice fast, you will more than ever have to deal with other people's minds too. For when you move away from the crowd, they will give you, quote unquote, their peace of mind. And as you might have guessed, that will most likely be about food and your supposed imminent starvation and decline because you are on a juice fast after all. How mindful of them. As you might now start to realize, you will have to deal with your own mind and those of others. To begin with, People who are so willingly wanting to give you a piece of their mind at the expense of you and your integrity are very easily swept aside. Especially when you realize that you can get rid of their nuisance very easily by showing them pictures of what is coming out of you. In almost every case, whenever I propose to have a look at the pictures of the stuff coming out of me after weeks or months of consuming nothing but freshly squeezed juices, they would turn away and run and move as if the building or surroundings were on fire. Again. This is why it is important to actually document your juice fast thoroughly. Although this is hilarious for the first couple of times, you will eventually appreciate the fine art of being left alone by the utilization of these photographic strategies. However, this goes both ways. Just imagine actually having someone with an open mind and who actually wants to see these pictures out of interest. But you don't have them. You just missed a prime opportunity in perhaps changing someone's life. In what way you would have changed this person's life is up for debate, disgust or motivation are up for a toss with this one. When getting a peace of mind from others, we must also of course realize that our friends and family might be inclined to do the same. This can be a lot harder to deal with, as you will most likely deeply care for these individuals, or at least I hope so. I personally never had any troubles with this, as my family and friends knew and still know that when I say I will do something, I will, and there is not a thing they can do about it. However, even I admit you will need a tough skin to deal with periodic feedback questions, and perhaps even scrutiny from friends and family. Of course, we don't want to use our photographic terror tactics too quickly over here. Keep in mind that they are most likely worried about you, and it is best to explain to them, in detail, what you are doing, why you are doing it, that you have a tight grip on all the variables, and that you know what you are getting nutritionally. These factors all help my family with finding mental rest in regards to my juice fasting. It of course didn't stop them from being alarmed when I decided to do a 57 day second juice fast a mere five and a half months after completing my 119 day first juice fast. You can imagine I had quite a laugh about that one. Another aspect of dealing with the minds of others is that from their point of view, you are no longer fully part of one of their biggest social and exciting events of the day, namely eating. As you well know, and as I talked about in my first video, the average individual thinks about food all day and most of the time eats the entire day as well. When you don't eat, however, you are not actively participating in this daily festivity. 
consciously or unconsciously, they will act different in these situations to watch you. I remember that during my first juice fast, my colleagues at work were always acting sort of strange and weird about me sitting there with my juices. They had no idea how to respond to or approach me, as the usual food talks would not suffice. They also seemed to feel sort of guilty for eating in front of me, as if they were actively trying to sabotage me with their foods, as if almost tempting me. They talked to each other about this or that food they were eating, telling each other how much they were enjoying it. They were talking about what they were going to eat later or during the weekend, mentioning that dinner they had planned on Saturday, for example. But I wasn't included in any of it, and it usually made for hilariously awkward situations. The same happened whenever I would visit my friends or family. It could go a couple of ways, but most of the time it would result in some of them asking if I needed anything, some quote-unquote real food instead of juices, or they would just ask me how the juices were tasting and if I wasn't missing food already or being tempted by their delights. Whenever their food was in front of them, the conversation would switch to the delights of the food and I was again put in the shoes of the weird outsider who was sort of there but not participating fully. It was unlike anything I have ever experienced, even when you take into account that eating purely raw foods, they would show some of these tendencies, but only very mildly. Now for me, all of this really wasn't a big thing. I wasn't really present that much in these situations anyway. However, this is a thing that I have heard others had to deal with on their juice fast too. Whether this happens to everyone, and to what degree, I cannot say. But from all those that I have spoken to, I heard that they have in general experienced this kind of situation to a certain extent. It is therefore advisable to prepare yourself in some way for such occasions to occur, especially if it would bother you, since we are talking of some sort of a social isolation. Speaking of preparing yourself in some way for specific occasions, it can also happen that some of your friends, family, acquaintances, or perhaps even strangers you meet through your acquaintances such as colleagues, will literally verbally and energetically try to attack you during your juice fast. It seems, as I learned throughout my own experiences and those of others I've spoken to, that doing a juice fast invoked in them an alarming sense of fear and personal danger when it comes to their way of living and their pleasantries. A juice fast would go against their entire way of thinking and their entire way of living and quote-unquote enjoying life. Their hostile behavior seems, at least to me, to be a way of coping with being confronted with their lifestyle choices. Their hostility can range from trying to attack the juice fasting itself or trying to attack you personally for using such an quote-unquote extreme unscientific liquid diet. Yes, I had somebody throw that at me. I personally always enjoyed these moments as people would only make that mistake with me once and then regret it. People who know me personally know that I love a discussion and I will discuss a point I have absolute faith in for hours and hours on end. Basically, until the sun sets and eventually rises again. When confronted with these types of people, who would at first try to attack the message, being the juice fasting, and then switch to attacking the messenger, being me, I would use all the ruthless means at my disposal to get these people off my back. Perhaps some of you will shy away from the word ruthless, but you must realize that these people will stop at nothing to try and destroy your morale, motivation, and eventually ridicule you back into the line of their supposed quote-unquote true way of living. It will help you greatly too to know that my strategy was set up completely around letting them empty their stockpiles of arguments, that they tried to spoon serve me from their common sense piggy bank. You know these arguments very well. They are all based on the so-called common sense from our society. To name a few, we have the supposed our brains grew from cooked food argument, which goes hand in hand with the especially grains made our brains grow argument. We then of course have the human species evolved significantly from consuming meat and thus we can't abandon our species most precious nutritional resource argument. Of course this then flows to our so-called need for excessive protein, there being no such thing as detox, and the fact that fruit not being available year round all around the world is proof enough that we shouldn't be relying on it, or here it is, even eating it. Of course you will also have the too much concentrated and bad sugar argument thrown at your head as well. Eventually they might even resort to hilarious claims of knowing people who did a juice fast or a juice detox protocol and who damaged or severely depleted themselves with it. You can sweep these arguments aside very easily by explaining to your loosely tongued adversaries that in order for us to consume these brain improving grains, we had to use fire, for our bodies can't handle the anti-nutrients present in these grains outer layers when they are in their raw state and we would therefore kill ourselves in the process of eating these in their raw state. We of course have no anatomical capabilities for digesting raw grains. In order for us to master the fire necessary to eat these grains, we had to enlarge our brains in the first place. Since we couldn't eat these grains for that purpose as we lacked the fire to process them, 
it would naturally fall on raw foods such as plants and fruits to enlarge our brains. As you can well imagine, this will shatter some of their beliefs straight away. You can then proceed to counter another argument, namely that meat-eating evolved the human species significantly and thus we can't abandon our species' most precious nutritional resource. You can of course easily counter this nonsense with the fact that our anatomy is identical to plant eaters and frugivores, meaning that our anatomical origin does not lay with eating meat and that our current anatomical makeup doesn't support meat eating now either. Not to mention that we are not anatomically built to catch animals, rip them apart and then eat them raw. Furthermore, before the invention of fire, there was no way for us to eat meat extensively for longer periods of time as we need to cook most of the meats in order to consume them without them causing immediate serious problems. Of course, you will now counter their ludicrous protein argument simply by explaining that in our most developing state, where we grow and develop at immense rates and lay the physical foundation for our later lives, namely the infant stage, we would of course require the most amount of protein for our development. In this stage, we consume and should primarily consume mother's milk. Mother's milk is designed by nature for the exact purpose of growing a human infant as fast and efficiently as possible. It will of course be a shocker to learn that mother's milk contains less than 10% protein. If protein was indeed as important as many people make it out to be, this number would be a lot higher. Not to mention that roughly 60% of the infant's energy consumption will go straight to the brain development, which makes it all the more interesting. If opposition remains stiff, you can also use the fact that if protein was so mightily important, then why does the body purge the lean body mass and utilizes excessive dietary protein to create new carbohydrates or sugars through gluconeogenesis? Why does it not create protein out of carbohydrates then? Very simple answer, because it values glucose over protein. For the matter of detox not being a reality, you can simply refer to the fact that if there is a thing as intoxication, in this case not alcoholism, but intoxication of toxins and chemicals, then there is also a thing that is called detoxification. After all, our liver filters the blood and neutralizes toxins. The kidneys also filter the body in accordance and eliminate the toxins from the body. This is detoxification at its finest. If there is no such thing as detoxification, then why do we have a lymphatic system that collects waste matter and toxins from the body so that our organs and bodily systems can eliminate them? Why then do we have lymph nodes near our skin? one of our biggest eliminative organs. Why do the bacteria in these lymph nodes convert the collected waste matter from roughly 3 pH to 6 pH so the body can process them safely and get rid of them? Indeed, because detoxification is a real thing. Of course, then we get to the too much sugar argument and the so-called proof that since fruit doesn't grow year-round in all places of the world, that you shouldn't rely on it or eat it. The sugar argument is easily countered. The studies they might have heard of or the common sense they might refer to have always studied fructose or, for example, highly concentrated corn syrup in a vacuum and then claim that sugar is bad. That would be the same as observing people lost at sea drinking seawater, dehydrating from it, eventually dying from it, and then claim that water in general is bad. Of course, when dealing with highly refined and concentrated sugars, which are undone of all nutritional compounds and enzymes, it is instantly notable that they are not good for the body. This is why you will never find such anomalies in nature. You will find sugars that are combined with water, enzymes, minerals, vitamins, fiber, and much more. Of course, they will spin their sugar raises the insulin level argument now, especially when concentrated in juice. This is easily swept aside by the fact that juices still contain phytonutrients, which act to slow down the release and absorption of sugars and make it very comparable to the effects of eating the whole fruit or vegetable. As for fruit not growing everywhere year-round, which is a fact and certainly true, this still doesn't change the fact that we are anatomically designed for eating a plant and fruit based diet. As for fruit not growing everywhere year round, that is not an argument that says anything against not eating fruit or relying on it. It rather proves the point that humans aren't living in their ideal environment. Remind them that every tree can be a fruit tree and we would still have sufficient plant and fauna diversity to keep our planet going. If we would rely mostly or fully on eating grains and animals, we wouldn't have the space or the resources on earth to house it all since most grains grown actually go to feed the livestock in the first place. Finally, you can of course easily dispose of their supposed arguments that they know someone who did a juice fast or a juice detox protocol and who severely damaged or depleted themselves with it. The common juice detox protocols offer way too little juice and will never allow you to cover your basal metabolic rate or other caloric needs based on your activity and of course the needed nutritional value. 
I see many of them offering 1800 calories for three whole days. Yes, that is just 600 calories per day. They are commercial exploits, nothing more. Their existence has nothing to do with a proper juice fast at all. As for people severely damaging themselves with a juice fast, this can't be seen as a valid argument against juice fasting either. This can actually be said of any of the popular so-called diet trends, since whenever someone doesn't know what they are doing, they can cause serious damage to themselves, no matter what they are doing. A properly conducted juice fast that covers all your needs and addresses all your possible areas of attention will not harm you. Now after you have effectively disposed of their arguments, they will either retreat or resort to attacking you personally. Slurs and phrases such as you have no idea what you are talking about. You have gone mad. You are not making any sense. You have no idea what you are doing. You will ruin your health with this. You might ruin someone else's health with this. You are dogmatic. You are paranoid. You are looking unhealthy. You are looking thin. You need some real food. And many others just like these might start to emerge. They will now aim their words at you personally and your supposed imminent demise, starvation and lack of health. This is the point where you can conclude that you have effectively won the informational part of the argument and you can now proceed to finish off their resistance once and for all. After you have concluded that you have effectively disposed of their arguments and that they are now attacking you personally, it is time to go on the attack yourself. You will now raise your own arguments, to which they will, in almost all cases, have no remark or response. Firstly, you can explain that you have eaten the standard Western diet and possibly other types of diets and have now commenced your juice fast. In my own case, I ate the standard Western diet, a typical bodybuilding diet, a junk food diet, a vegetarian diet, a cooked vegan diet, and a raw food diet. In the most likely scenario, they have only eaten the standard Western diet or a slight variation of it. They have no idea what they are talking about when it comes to your experience being on a juice fast, as they have never tried it. You know what you are talking about out of your own experience, and you can truly compare the Western diet they are on to what you are doing now with the juice fast, as you did both. They have not. End of story. Secondly, you can explain that in consideration of our anatomy, the things humans eat on a regular basis are not naturally suited to our species. We have a very long food tube and must therefore eat things that are easily digestible and move through us quickly. This would naturally be simple foods that are high in water content. Most of the items humans eat on a daily basis are very low in water content. On top of this, the things humans eat, they need to process mainly by the use of fire. This destroys the nutrients in the food and alters them chemically, but also lowers the water content even further. You can add to this the fact that the colon will try to preserve as much water as it can from the foods, meaning that they will dry out even further in our digestive tract. This of course doesn't even take into account the chemical and toxic effects on us from these foods. This results in a slow and stagnant cesspool of a digestive tract that has many meals backed up inside of us. The things they call food can take up to three days to pass through us, which leaves plenty of time for this dried up and sticky matter to get stuck. Just imagine eating stuff like that for three to six times a day. You literally have proof of this, as you have not eaten solid food for weeks or months and drank nothing but freshly squeezed juices, yet you are still seeing solid bowel movements day after day. You can then ask them how it can be that there are still solid things coming out of you. They might claim this is bacteria and the juice creating it. However, their temporary resistance will break as soon as you explain that you can show them the photographs if they like. Explain to them that you will show them detailed pictures for their own education. Let them inspect it for themselves and say that it is simply bacteria and juices. They will flatly refuse in almost all cases. If they don't, then they will stop pestering you after seeing one or two photos. You can then proceed with the so-called finisher and challenge them with the following question. Why not try it yourself if you are so certain? Try it for a week and let me know how wrong I am. Document it all for us to see. Prove me wrong. I will hold you accountable for delivering real proof. They will, in almost every case I have ever experienced and heard from others, get cold feet and leave the argument alone. As you can imagine, these people and those that were there to witness it will leave you alone in regards to your juice fast from now on. These methods have always been an effective strategy in my repertoire in getting people off my back, no matter what subject they were bothering me with. It served me extremely well on my juice fast, and also served as a warning to other loudmouths that would like to have taken a jab at my juice fasting. I am certain it will serve you well too. Of course, you will want to adapt this strategy to your own personal ability. Be mindful not to ridicule these people, but rather show them respect when you slowly but surely smash the resistance and nonsense into a pulp. 
You must, however, act within a reasonable time frame when it comes to their verbal attacks, or else the mental cowards will join in, and eventually you will have an entire herd attacking you. Having dealt with the minds of others, possible social isolation, and probable personal attack, we will now look at the role of our own mind during a juice fast. I will begin by explaining the principle of moving your mind during a juice fast. When you started your juice fast, you of course made up your mind on why you are going to do your juice fast. You made up your mind on what the very reason is why you must do this, what you try to achieve with it, and why it is so important for you. These reasons are very important, and I advise anyone to either write them down or simply keep a very clear image of them in your mind. For dealing with the minds of others is one thing, but dealing with that never-ending avalanche of thoughts, emotions, and rationalization that is sitting between your own two ears is a completely different affair. We all know this to be true. The mind can play games with us, and this will happen in many occasions on the juice fast too. When I speak of moving the mind, I speak of moving the mind back and forth between whatever you are dealing with at this present moment and the very reason why you have started your juice fast. When I speak of moving the mind, I also mean to use your mind productively and analytically by keeping notes, spending your time wisely, and being on the lookout for anything that might help you on your juice fast. I will explain these principles with a couple of examples from my own juice fasts. If you are doing a juice fast at present, or have done one in the past, you will recognize most, if not all, of these examples. If there is anything you like to add to them, please do so in the comments below. Personally, I never experienced any type of serious motivational problem during my juice fasting. My first juice fast, which lasted 119 days, if you exclude the break in the fast period, never saw me experience any motivational breakdown or a moment of wanting to give up. Food didn't appeal to me at all, and I wasn't looking forward to eating for almost all of my 119 day juice fast. I was feeling amazing, energized, slept like a baby without a care in the world, and I saw demon upon demon coming out of me from the behind. To be quite honest, it was so exciting that I almost got greedy with wanting to get more out of my body. I wanted it to get fully clean. However, around day 104, when I celebrated my 27th birthday during my juice fast, I was starting to get this feeling creeping up in me that I didn't want to be tied down to the juicing machine anymore. My mind was racing with all kinds of possibilities to finally be rid of my dependency on this juicing machine. I was dreaming of times to come where I would simply grab a few pieces of fruit and be out and about for hours upon hours without having to worry about making juice or being near a toilet. However, I was able to keep these thoughts and eventual emotions in check simply by constantly going back to why I was doing my juice fast in the first place. I had my reasons. I wanted to be clean and see all of this junk to be moved out of my body. I had no idea I would actually, as it turned out, be empty a mere four days later. The last four days on which I eliminated on my juice fast had huge and immense old stuff coming out of me. Had I at that moment given in, that stuff might still have resided in me and caused problems. Although my example was light, I do know of many people who struggled with motivation during their prolonged juice fast, especially near the end. You will want to rid yourself of this dependency on the juicing machine and want to be fully free again to go out and about without having to worry about juices or a toilet. These mental battles can become quite severe and some actually give in. However, moving your mind back to the very reason why you are doing your juice fast will in most cases pull you through. You can even write yourself a detailed letter on why you start your juice fast and what you want to achieve with it. Write it as if writing it to yourself in the future, when you are in the midst of the deep moments of your juice fast. Imagine reading a letter from yourself to yourself, discussing that you mustn't give up, why you started it all, and why you must see it through to the end. Believe me, you will not want to fail yourself after such a letter. When doing a juice fast, you will want to start moving your mind in your favor in all aspects of your life. As many of you know, and many of you will soon discover, you will require less sleep during a juice fast. This leaves you with a lot more free time for you to use wisely. However, having more free time and spending more free time with your thoughts can also make sure that you will have to battle that rampaging, rationalizing little beast between your ears more often. In short, your mind can and will play games with you. Instead of playing along with these games, it is advisable to simply use your newly acquired free time to learn something you would want to learn. Use this time to read books, learn about growing your own food, or how to revitalize the land around you. Perhaps you want to learn more about the human body, or perhaps real history has your interest. Maybe you want to start exercising more, or spend some time working in your garden. Whatever it is you want to do, spend your extra time on it and make it worth your while. This will have a profound and inspirational effect on you. It will prevent you from wasting your time and getting lost in possibly sabotaging thoughts. It will allow you to move your mind in your favor. Another thing that ties into spending your time wisely 
is to, as previously mentioned, keep notes on your juice fast. Notes on what you are drinking, what you are consuming nutritionally, what is happening with your movements, and how often your bowels move are some of the prime examples of analytically employing your mind in your favor. This will only require a bit of your time a day, but it is greatly beneficial with regards to investing yourself even further into your juice fast. This additional information will help you combat any type of motivational and or emotional swing. You are literally documenting information on what is happening to you on a daily basis, which is highly motivating and after all, keeping things in perspective. We spoke of the quote-unquote photographic terror tactics that you can employ to keep the nuisance of other minds as far away from you as possible. These tactics, however, also work on yourself. Whenever you feel you are slipping into a motivational rut or you feel you are getting less favored or even negative towards your juice fast, you might want to have another look at the photographs of the movements you had. You will remember why you are doing such an important job with your juice fast and why it must continue. Taking a look at your notes will then reinvigorate you as you will see how much you have already progressed in emptying your body of this foul, uneliminated, stinking waste matter. A little side note to this analytical aspect of moving your mind in your favor. You can also use specific scales that measure your body on different levels, such as body weight, obviously, but also body fat percentage, bone mass, muscle mass, and for example the overall water percentage of the body. Watching these aspects change over time is very interesting and motivational at the same time. This could be a wonderful addition to your analytical efforts. Another aspect in which you can move your mind in your favor is to keep video logs of your juice fast. Of course, when we hear the word video log or vlog, we think of uploading these to YouTube for the whole world to see. This is of course something you could consider and it will be something that is exciting and fun to do. However, in regards to video logs, I do not mean uploading them per se. What I actually mean is to keep them for your private use. You can do a video log every other week or perhaps every few weeks or every month. This way you film an entire update for yourself. This update you can then later rewatch to boost your morale and your motivation. These video logs can be anything you like, but be sure to aim them directly at yourself as if you are the intended audience for it. You will get rekindled by your own excitement and energy. It is also advisable to have a look at others documenting their juice fasts online. Their videos, thoughts and experiences will help you on your juice fast too. When experiencing cravings or memories of foods we used to eat, we can especially employ the mind in our favor and move it in such ways that we can effectively keep cravings and or these memories at bay. These cravings and memories are something that almost all of us will eventually deal with. They can be physical, mental or both combined. I personally never experienced any physical cravings for any unnatural food during my first juice fast. Funnily enough, all my cravings were mental and emotional and usually popped up whenever something old or nasty was starting to slide towards the exit. Speaking of funny, I did however crave a salad near the end of my first juice fast. I know, quite extreme. So firstly, when dealing with cravings, I would like to reiterate again that cravings are, in most cases, of short duration and last no longer than 5 to 10 minutes. It is in this time frame that people usually act upon them. If they wouldn't, nothing would happen and the craving would disappear. However, when dealing with old and perhaps very old uneliminated waste matter finally making its way out, it can be accompanied by intense and sometimes very old memories or emotions indeed. It can be quite tough to deal with these emotions. Sometimes they can overwhelm you or get very close to doing so. There are, however, a few things you can use to combat these emotions and stop them from overwhelming you. We can, of course, employ our analytical information to give us an understanding of when these cravings, memories or emotions show up and what they might be related to. I personally discovered that I always had these memories of the foods I ate years ago show up whenever something nasty and big was about to come out of me. For me personally, it would start with some light emotions and memories. A dinner we once had in which I ate a specific meal, for example. Then, this would be followed up by a period of more intense memories and very specific details about the meals and the people who were with me at the time. This was itself followed by this cooked food hunger sensation. You know what I talk about. This all gone morbid sensation in your stomach and gut area. This would last anywhere from 5 to 25 minutes and was very intense. This was then followed by this intense feeling of having something released inside of me. I could feel it sliding through me and move its way towards the exit. Shortly after, or perhaps no more than 12 hours later, I would see a huge movement show up. At first, I was taken aback by this as I had no idea what was happening. But after having this occur to me a couple of times, I realized when reviewing my notes that this happened every single time when something old and nasty was about to come out. I had discovered a pattern. 
This ended up being the pattern that kept repeating itself all the way up to my last solid and nasty movement. Having this information made me extremely capable in tackling these emotional responses to whatever was coming out of me, as I could prepare for them and sometimes even anticipate them. I wasn't overwhelmed by them anymore, but rather excited, for the memories and emotions I was experiencing, and especially their intensity, would give me some insight in what was coming and even what I had done when creating the mangled mess of nastiness that was now slowly creeping its way out. I would like to revisit these memories and emotions a little further as I employed an interesting strategy at first, when I hadn't realized what I was actually dealing with. What I did is something we can all do, namely to make a mental link between the extremely nasty waste matter we see coming out of us and the possible food-related memories or emotions coming up. During my first juice fast, I had a moment where I was nearly overwhelmed by specific food-related memories and emotions. This happened around day 35 to 45. At this time, I was on the brink of discovering the previously mentioned pattern. For some bizarre reason, I was having a lot of emotional memories come back to me about eating pizza with my family and some friends. This was rather odd to me, as I never liked pizza that much in the past. It became even stranger when I realized that in my mind, I was romanticizing these memories. I realized I was very fond of these memories, and the pizza seemed to be the central theme here. I was taken completely aback, and at first, had no idea how to cope with these feelings. So, as any other mortal would do in this situation, I started watching a video series on American pizza. Do not ask me why, I have no clue either. After watching some of these episodes and seeing these people create memories with the pizzas, I realized that I could employ the same memory bonanza the other way around too, just by using my mind. I simply reverse engineered the exact same emotional association, but I linked them to the particularly nasty movements I was having and had had during the previous weeks of juice fasting. Whenever I had these weird emotional food related memories show up, and I felt they were of an intense nature, I would simply instantly think of the nasty smells, horrible waste matter, and above all the disgusting feelings they would produce when coming out. I was completely amazed at the effectiveness of this tactic. It was so effective that whenever I smelled cooked food whilst being out and about, or for example with friends and family, or at any type of social occasion, I would automatically imagine the waste matter, the smells, and the feelings they produced. After employing this tactic, I never had an issue with memories or emotions getting close to overwhelming me again. You might want to consider this strategy for yourself as well. It is very potent. Another useful strategy when it comes to moving the mind in your favor is to find allies who are on the same path as you are. Allies on the hero's journey, so to speak. I can go into an extended rhetoric as to why it is useful, but I can imagine you are able to conclude the same thing on your own. Being in contact with people who also did a juice fast or are going through a juice fast themselves will help you tremendously. Nothing beats a good conversation and receiving understanding from another who knows exactly what you are talking about and going through. As a matter of fact, there are plenty of social media platforms out there such as Facebook where groups of people have come together to talk about their juice fasting experience and share useful information and to support each other. There are of course YouTube communities where you can find similar support and Instagram has a gigantic growing juice fasting community as well. Whatever you do during your juice fast, be sure to find some allies. I personally met many amazing people through my juice fasting, some of whom I now call my friends. I am eternally grateful to have met them. To summarize, when doing a juice fast, you will have to move your mind in a couple of ways. You will have to deal with the minds of others who will try to give you a piece of their mind. You will also have to deal with possible experiences of being an outsider at eating-oriented festivities. You will have to find ways of dealing with this and prepare yourself for this. For example, Photographic tactical movements are hilariously effective at making people who are annoying go away. As mentioned, you can also experience personal attack when on your juice fast. People might experience your juice fast as an indirect attack on their way of living and their way of enjoying their so-called pleasantries of life. They will want to protect their own way of life at all costs. They will try to attack juice fasting at first with a multitude of arguments, which you can easily dispose of with the examples I showed you. Once they have depleted their common sense piggy banks, they will then start to attack you, the messenger, personally. This is the moment where you can now raise your own arguments and see an end to their resistance for the rest of the duration of your juice fast. As I mentioned, you must be swift in doing so, for you do not want the mental cowards to join them and have to struggle with an entire herd of these types. You will also want to employ your mind in your favor in every possible way, using your free time well to be productive and enjoy yourself, as well as utilizing your mind to produce comprehensive notes that will give you plenty of insights on your juice fast. These insights will then allow you to get a better grasp of how to deal with specific mental hurdles as well as allow you to employ strategies to keep you going on the right track.
It is also of great importance to find allies on your journey so that you can be understood and share a good conversation and find support. This is the end of chapter 3 and the end of the informational part of this video. Closing thoughts. With concluding chapter 3, we will conclude part 2 of this video series. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something from it. As previously mentioned, if you have any questions or anything to add, then you can do so in the comments. There will also be a pinned comment with links to my website where you can find offerings for coaching if you need support or some accountability for your raw food lifestyle or juice fasting. There will also be links to specific content I referred to in this video and other useful links and details. In the next video, we will go over two more chapters. Chapter 5 will go over taking it day by day and sharing your journey. Chapter 6 will deal with going the distance and breaking the fast. I will try to upload this video as soon as possible, but as you can imagine, writing and recording the chapters as well as shooting the accompanying video imagery will take some time. I hope you have a wonderful day and may the juice be with you.